Maybe, Doris, if, if starting with you, um, you're obviously looking across Europe um, in terms of the investment side. How do you see these markets, CE markets, in that context? Now, Invesco Real Estate in Europe has 7 billion um, of assets under management, um, and around 12% of that is based here in the Central and Eastern European region. We started investing here already in 98, and I think our understanding has always been that the region is really part of a strategic pan-European portfolio. So this was never meant to be a dip in, dip out, um, but rather meant to stay. Now, I think um, before I start talking about the differences in the market, it is probably worthwhile to explain you what our definition of Central and Eastern Europe at this particular moment is. You may find it slightly boring, but it actually is restricted to the Czech Republic and Poland. We were invested in the past in Hungary as well, but that was a relatively short-term thing, I must admit, um, and did loads of fact-finding missions into Bulgaria, Romania, um, Russia as well. For various reasons, we never invested there. Um, we were particularly looking at it in the years of 2005 to 2007. In retrospect, probably a good thing. Um, but as of now, what we realize is that our institutional investors in the aftermath of uh, the global financial crisis have become very hesitant to go into markets where they cannot control the political environment. So there's a real limitation in Central and Eastern Europe at the moment um, from the perspective of a long-term institutional investor in terms of where it can go into. You need obviously the political framework, the legal framework, you need liquidity, market size, and all of that, I must admit, um, comes into play much more in the two markets which I mentioned. So, um, as I said, our assets under management currently are around 12% um, or close to a billion. We are still active in the region. The latest purchase was obviously the Platz Uni, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and we are still looking at further investments in Poland, the same as in the Czech Republic. Now, if we look at differentiators and how do we really see the markets in the context of a pan-European portfolio, some of that was already mentioned earlier by Damien. It clearly is a growth story. I mean, when you look at the rest of Europe, we are all flat. So there isn't much happening. So if you want to have a share in your portfolio in a real growth market, then clearly it has to be Poland in this specific case. Poland and the Czech Republic have different criteria um, when you add them to a portfolio, because Poland's historically always been much more volatile in terms of rental growth or rental falls, probably more than growth over the last years. Um, but that obviously has a place in a portfolio. You just need to be much more timing driven, whilst the Czech Republic is more stable. Again, another very positive element if you can bet on something. There's been a slight decline of rents, but certainly not as dramatic as we saw it in Poland, or more so specifically. Um, Pricing differential is the obvious point um, because we're still talking about probably 100 to 150 basis points more than when you actually invest somewhere in Western Europe. And that, in my view, is a substantial driver and it is certainly more about perceived risks than real risks. And let me tell you that from the perspective of someone who has been active specifically here in Poland since 2000. So I think I can relatively clearly see where the risks are. And frankly, yes, it is slightly more illiquid um, than Western European markets, but if you have a long-term investor behind you, then certainly you can ride that cycles. So, as I said, I think it's more about perceived risks than real. And um, <clears throat> just, just to pick up that, that point uh, on sentiment, um, it, difficult for you to bring investors into the other markets. Um, we've seen from Damien's slide that, that there's more kind of expected growth now um, in Romania, in Hungary. Does that mean that investment, that, that sentiment is beginning to change? Um, are you seeing that in, in the investors that you're talking to? Towards Hungary, no doubt. But to be fair, we were invested in Hungary in the past. So that is a relatively easy one. As soon as you can see growth picking up, we certainly will have a number of our investors being ready to look at that. 
Romania, I think, is a slightly different case. And part of that also came out of Damien's presentation earlier. Um, I'm personally slightly concerned about the real growth perspectives there because we're talking about cheap labor at the moment and that is a trend or a wave that is constantly moving further either east or south. Now, do you really want to put the long-term bet on that? I know that some of you working in Romania or with Romania will find that um, a rather critical and unfair comment. Um, but if you are supposed to invest for 10, 15, 20 years in a country, then you would like to see a longer term trend. And that is my main concern at this particular moment. So I wouldn't rule it out. Okay, good. Um, Walter, you're obviously active across the region. Um, what are you seeing in terms of, let's say, new capital coming in, new capital seeking loans? Um, <clears throat> and are you, where do you see it in terms of lending in, in around the region? Are there places that you will lend, won't lend? What's, what's the situation? So in terms of, uh, in terms of lending, we are active in uh, Poland, the Czech Republic, um, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, and also Romania. Um, I would say the majority of capital uh, is still looking um, uh, to go into Poland um, and Prague. Maybe a little bit in some secondary cities in the Czech Republic, but predominantly Poland and, 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 and Prague. Um, having said that, I think there is a clear evidence that uh, uh, Budapest is picking up um, over the last uh, six to nine months, um, as uh, was already discussed yesterday, as uh, um, a significant change um, in, the, in, the, in the attitude of international capital towards Hungary. Um, I think partially that has to do with uh, what's happening elsewhere, and partially it has to do with the real estate fundamentals in the, in the Budapest market. In terms of um, capital sources, I mean, clearly everybody is looking for, for, for yield. Um, real estate as an asset class uh, is clearly sought after. Um, allocations into real estate are increasing. Um, and uh, we do see new capital sources coming into those markets. For example, um, Asian money is now coming um, into Poland, uh, into the Czech Republic, uh, stronger than it used to be. Um, we see um, some of the uh, smaller German um, uh, insurance companies or pension funds looking into the region um, that may not have um, done that before. Um, it's also interesting to see that the, the way the capital is invested is changed. So you see fewer and fewer commingled funds. You see more and more separate mandates, um, single mandates um, going into the region. So all of that has, uh, has, has changed over the last couple of years. Okay, good. Um, and one of the interesting things that we had from our, our trip where we took um, kind of European opportunities over to Shanghai a couple of weeks ago um, was that their view very much was not on countries at all but actually on cities um, and that that was how they were looking at the world that it didn't really matter what the country was it was the city that was their interest um, and I'm just wondering even in, in when you're looking at, at, at the city side how do you see CE? Um, which cities do you think are successful? How do we, we, we heard from um, Vienna yesterday, how do you see that in that context? What's your kind of overall view of, of assessing the cities within the region? Well, it is cities clearly. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, Warsaw, it's uh, the bigger cities in Poland, um, Krakow, Wroclaw, uh, Gdansk, um, and then it's Prague and it's Budapest. Um, I, to an extent, you, you, you could think of places like Brno, but it's really, it's, it's really to the, bigger, to the bigger extent, cities that have a million or, or more inhabitants um, that have a function as a regional capital, in most cases as a capital of a, of a, of a, of a nation as well, um, that, uh, that drive the demand. With the, exception, with the exception of retail, I would say. That's, the, that, that, that's maybe a slightly different thing. When we talk office, we really talk capital cities and a couple of regional cities in Poland. When we talk retail, it's different. Okay, good. And Eva, from an, from an AEW perspective, how do you see those cities? Which ones are you invested in? Which ones are, your, which ones are the ones that you favor? 
AEW has over 18, 18 billion uh, assets under management right now across Europe, but uh, around one, 1 billion is uh, concentrated in Central Europe. What I would like to say is that Central Europe for me is a very diversified region. I know that everything is packed right, right now in one basket, but it's not like this. I agree that Prague and, and, and Warsaw are the most interesting markets for all the investors. However, they are currently, because they are more matured compared to the other Central European, um, Central European countries and, and cities. However, the, uh, the cost and the pricing is quite high compared to Budapest or compared to Bucharest, which means simply that if somebody is seeking for some profit opportunities in the future, then it's uh, Warsaw and Prague perhaps uh, met their limit. Perhaps there is still some, some margin to, to, to improve and the yield compression. Um, however, when we compare the yields between Warsaw and Bucharest and the differences for the prime assets, office assets, is 150 basis points, it's quite substantial. And I would say that Romania is um, like Poland 10 years ago. So assuming that the good um, policy, because now the environment is uh, under uh, huge changes and political environment as well, business environment, it might, it might be the, the, the big change and the big chance for the future investors for Romania. So I would say that um, Prague and Warsaw are, are the most matured market and they are the safest way to invest the capital. However, there are the other markets which uh, are very attractive and very interesting provided there is the long-term vision in terms of the investment. Okay, good. Um, and I wanted to turn to, to Poland, really. Um, and Przemyslav, obviously Griffin's seen impressive growth. Um, I'm wondering what's driving this. Um, and, and also your, your focus has been on Poland. And, and it'd be interesting to see what the opportunities were that you specifically saw here. Well, what drove our growth was probably a combination of two factors. One factor was that we had access to the right capital at the right time. What I mean by that is that we had access back in 2009-2010 to opportunistic capital and the very vast sources of opportunistic capital. If you were to have access to more core or core plus or even value add capital, you wouldn't be so successful. We had a very broad mandate. We still have a very broad mandate and we could do anything from senior lending to trading land bank uh, through buying, you know, standing assets, doing developments and investing into corporates, uh, asset-rich corporates. And, uh, and the second uh, uh, element of, of this was that we had the right uh, uh, skill set at hand. And what I mean by that is that our team is a combination of uh, private equity and real estate that gave us uh, also some op 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 Operation, operational uh, capabilities in terms of running the businesses we acquired and uh, starting the platforms we, we started from scratch, like a student housing platform, which is the largest uh, student housing platform in Poland today. So that's in a nutshell, you know, uh, how I see uh, the reasons behind, uh, behind our success. We have currently uh, about 4 billion in terms of assets under management only in Poland. And we will focus only on Poland going forward. We are not moving outside of Poland. Main reason for that is uh, that we would like to, our resources to be really concentrated or, uh, on the market which we know and we, we feel comfortable with. Uh, going outside doesn't give us any good. You know, if you go to Czech Republic or to, to Hungary, those are one city countries. And uh, in Poland, we have at least five or six cities we can, we can focus on. So that's the uh, main reason. When it comes to opportunities, we see uh, we see a lot of opportunities still in uh, both retail, traditional, you know, retail and office uh, um, space. Uh, office one is driven mostly by the BPO uh, trends, the, the business outsourcing, which uh, Poland is a beneficiary of, and I do not necessarily agree that this is only driven by the cost of labor. It's mostly now driven by the access to. Uh, uh, educated uh, workforce, whomever we talk to in terms of uh, people, you know, thinking about moving their operations to Poland, they're mostly talking about Polish universities, Polish students being well educated and, uh, you know, you get uh, value for quality there. Retail still remains very interesting, uh, also in some of the uh, main cities, including Warsaw, so we are big investors and big believers in, in, uh, uh, in retail. 
Uh, and apart from that, we're starting uh, uh, new initiatives like student housing, which is already 1,200 uh, uh, rooms and soon, soon to get us to 3,000. We have an aim to get altogether to 8,000 rooms. We also started uh, a resi rental platform. We raised money from Oakland and from PIMCO to, uh, to start that. And uh, currently, Echo Investment has about 3,500 uh, rental apartments under production. So those are things which, are, which uh, uh, we are getting to. And of course, naturally, we will go later on into senior housing or elderly care, things like that. So b basically building businesses around the uh, real estate team. And uh, uh, one of the things that was <coughs> picked up yesterday as well was um, the idea of, of more local capital, more, uh, and actually Damien picked it up there as well, as that if you can encourage more small, medium-term businesses that will grow, you're an example of a, of a high growth business based here. Um, do you think, I mean, I'm interested that there's more local pension funds. Do you see that local capital beginning to play a much more important role um, in the Polish market and in CE markets more generally? Well, I, I think it's more, uh, it's more about insurance money than it is about pension money in, in terms of real estate. I think, you know, uh, even if we don't see that today, I think we're going to see that very soon because at the end of the day, they need to find something which yields, you know, above what uh, governments, uh, banks and uh, corporate bonds can pay. Uh, so naturally, they're going to move there and, uh, you know, the major insurance companies try to enter this market. Some of them... Uh, had so, so, some success, some uh, uh, of them didn't. It was probably mostly driven by the quality of people running these organizations. So I think even if they're going to be, uh, you know, withdrawing, they're probably going to be re-entering again. So we think uh, insurance money will be investing in, in uh, local insurance money will be investing uh, in, uh, in real estate. And I'm not only talking about the insurance money, which is, uh, you know, a, a Polish or the Czech one, but also international, you know, out of, out, out of, local, uh, out of local balance sheets. We, sh we see that more and more. Uh, pension money, I am not so sure they will ever get there, you know, uh, maybe, but uh, for the time being, you know, I don't think there are products uh, uh, for them. We are one of the um, uh, groups who sponsors uh, the new legislation, read the legislation, which will allow, you know, these people to invest. But, uh, you know, for the time being, we are taking our REIT, uh, which is uh, called Echo Pride Properties, which is our joint venture with, uh, uh, with Redefine. Uh, we are taking this public within the next couple of months. We are taking this public on one of the European stock exchanges, which is not Warsaw Stock Exchange, and one of the stock, stock exchanges outside of Europe. So, and this is mostly driven by the fact that, you know, A, there is no legal framework here, and B, it's uh, the access to the capital. Okay, good. Um, uh, Marcus, I just wanted to come to you because you're obviously... <coughs> kind of representing a, a, a different type of investor. Um, I mean, when you're looking at the sort of family office, private equity kind of side, what are they looking for? Um, how active there are they in the region? The pri on the private equity side, um, and here I come back to, to um, the answers here of my colleagues on the panel, um, the investment strategy is driven by cost of capital. We see from family offices, they are very substance-oriented, um, don't want to take too much risk, uh, but we see this all across the board through Europe. And um, Central Europe is, um, they have very limited allocation, put it that way. They better, they'd rather go to Germany, to, to France, and let's see how, how they're gonna, how they're gonna change when we have the elections next year in Germany. That's, that's gonna be because um, I I've, I've want, to, want to refer to, um, the behavior of investors or the, um, uh, the expectation of investors when we look three, four years back about the opinions on Hungary. So, um, um, and, and here I'm coming to the private equity side. Um, a couple of years ago, we invested in Hungary and everybody said, oh, you're nuts, you're crazy. Um, but in the meantime, um, it paid off. And um, again, it depends really on the cost of capital. We invested in regional cities, in retail, in complicated product to some sort run down, turnaround projects, and now we are, um, at that time it was difficult, and nowadays it becomes better and better and better. So we see um, yield compression, um, fundamentals getting better, and I think um, everybody realizes um, this political environment, and I, I really want to hear from my colleagues on opinion about Poland, 
the, is, is the new normal. So um, let's see how this how this going to change uh, because years ago, Orban, everybody said he's nuts. These days, everybody says, oh, Hungary, it's a, it's a good play. So you see institutional investors going in because there is, as Walter said, um, a, um, uh, everybody is looking for yield, and that's that's exactly the uh, the issue. So you, either you climb up the, uh, the risk curve, or you or you change your perception. So um, <laughs> so and 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 this is this is what I see. I mean, um, in in the whole of central central Eastern Europe, that people now looking at Hungary, they never two years ago nobody looked at it, um, and I think even if. Um, there are concerns about Romania. Um, I think the perception will change as well, because um, there are opportunities in the market where you can achieve um, a certain yield level, um, even on a on a on a long term basis. And what was interesting to see in in Damien's presentation is uh, lower and longer. And this is a trend we see here in Central Eastern Europe as well. So this has completely changed from yeah, the pre-2008 period where everybody was really um, looking for short-term uh, returns, um, looking at yield compression in a, at, a, at a very short period of time. I mean, uh, remember 2007, um, the, the migration of yields in Romania. It was crazy. So um, at that time, we, um, we stopped lending when I was still with the bank. Um, I think th those times are over, um, and when you enter Central Eastern Europe, you have to have a longer view, and that's what we see from the capital side. And do, do you think, uh, Marcus, that that's also a function of the sheer weight of capital, looking that it's got to find somewhere, and so maybe it didn't like Hungary two years ago, but now it's got to place itself somewhere, so it suddenly thinks, oh, actually, Hungary doesn't look so bad now. Yeah, Western, Western Europe, is, it's very difficult to, to find good deals. You, you will find it. Um, you have to take a little bit more risk, um, but um, um, the um, amount of available of available product in Western Europe is uh, became very little. So therefore, w what we do see, um, we are, I'm, I'm advising a listed company in Germany, um, they are now considering and said, mm, yeah, Germany, it's very difficult um, yield-wise, product-wise, so why don't we look around Germany into the German-speaking markets, into Benelux, into Holland, because there is, there is a yield differential. It's exactly what what you said, um, uh, and you don't need to go to Central Eastern Europe. Most of the investors from Western Europe, um, they have a certain perception about um, Central Europe. Uh, even uh, when you talk about Poland, um, they, are, they have very limited allocation, and that's what we see here in the market. I mean, yes, there are transactions going on, but when you look at the, uh, uh, when, when you look at the, the statistics, you're going to see that um, there is a big gap between Western Europe and Central, Central Eastern Europe. So, um, and this speaks a clear language that um, investors are still reluctant, um, cautious to enter, uh, to enter markets like this. Okay, good. Um, Doris, I could see you wanted to pick something up from that. So, <laughs> and if there's, feel free to come in on any, uh, you know, if there's, a, if there's anything that you want to contribute to, please do come in. Don't wait for me to ask you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, uh, the comment about the political situation in Poland made me smile. Um, we obviously have capital from all around Europe, so not just Germany. Uh, but it's interesting to see how different the perception of the Polish situation was. Now, I'm fully aware that we Germans are not perceived to be the most cheerful people in any event. So I think we please ourselves more in the role of being the concerned ones. So um, and I think you have to see it in that context as well. But we all had serious problems when this political change appeared in Poland. And there was huge question marks. We had to write, I mean, my colleague is here, we had to write myriads of papers to our investors to convince them that this is just not as critical as they may perceive it. When I talked to my UK colleagues, they weren't even aware. This was like, so something happening in Poland, can you send us those papers? Now, what you realize is that the press has a big role to play here. It is just about how this is being presented to the public. And I guess in the case of Germany, there was just much more coverage. Now, um, is that a real threat? When you look at the numbers, at least um, in the first quarter of the, the investment and transactions, I don't think so. So I guess most people have accepted the fact that a big portion of the real estate investment just almost appears independent 
of what's happening around in the political framework. So I wouldn't say we ignore it, but what I'm saying is it has possibly less of an impact um, than we do think. And the same probably here applies to Hungary, but personally I would, um, I think, sign on the comment that a bit of that is yield-driven and people are just following. And I think we just need to be careful that we don't drop into or don't get into the same trap as we were in 2007, where there was a bit of ignorance of risk. So risk was perceived as an opportunity. Shamslavka. Well, I've been uh, only local on this uh, panel, so I, I cannot refrain from uh, not, uh, you know, making a comment to a comment here. I think, you know, A, you know, there is no nation which is immune to stupidity. That's the first comment I would make, you know. There were nations going totally cuckoo, you know, 50 years ago, a big nation which, you know, brought the uh, great philosophers and, uh, and writers went completely cuckoo. Very recently, you know, another nation uh, almost elected a 100% uh, patented Nazi as, a, as their president. So let's put things into the right perspective. I would prefer that my country wouldn't be a part of the European mainstream or global mainstream, but this is what is happening, you know. The Americans now have a choice between the communists, the crook, and, the, you know, the guy from another Lululand. So, and they, that's what they have to decide. So politically, it's not good, you know, and, but it's not good uh, globally, you know. There are global imbalances with this regard, and, you know, there is very recent experience we went through with our friends from Redefined from South Africa because we were just in the middle of the deal with them uh, when, you know, the government change happened in Poland. And we were, to explain to them, I sat with uh, the chairman of the company and I was trying to explain to him what is going to happen. And he is looking with me, you know, sort of, you know, and politely says, listen, you have no idea who Zuma is. So everything is relative, you know. In terms of, you know, the capital moving here and there, you know, we see even now American capital thinking about coming to Poland. We are in discussions with a number of U.S. investors because they think, you know, it's still a better place than their own homeland. You know, that's uh, what is happening. So we're going to see, unfortunately, we're going to go through a bumpy uh, times and on the, we're going to get on the bumpy road for a, for a time being, but uh, hopefully we're going to get to a better, you know, again. Good. Walter, yeah. I'm just, uh, just adding to that and uh, agreeing with Doris here, I think it's very important um, not to lose sight um, of the facts and not always looking at uh, what is being reported in a particular um, press in a particular country. You talked about the difference between Germany and the UK. I couldn't agree more. Um, take a step forward, further across the Atlantic. If you look at things from an American perspective, um, as my American colleagues will tell you, everything in Europe is left of center from their point of view. So, you know, it's, 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 you, it, 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 is, it is a question of from where you look at, at, at things. And uh, um, it, it's, 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 it, I think it's a mistake just looking uh, at the press in a particular country and then taking political risk from there. Eva, you wanted to pick that up. Yes, I would like to add one thing because as, for, as we are talking about the German investors, for example, whenever I meet them and they, whenever they come to Poland, the thing they ask not about the political risk, it's rather about the uh, vacancy and the supply of the office in Warsaw. So, so I agree with Przemysław um, that it's, it's a kind of the perception and it's a kind of the um, business-driven decisions, in fact. So the political situation, as we all know, it's not it's not so, uh, so not so good everywhere. So it's not only Poland as the exception. It's it's like you know across the Europe there are different, uh, different problems and different challenges, and everybody has to face them. So, uh, so it's 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 rather about the still business opportunities and when the money, where the money can and when the money can be invested. So you seem to have the more sophisticated investors. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Um, and there was an interesting one. Um, I was um, in uh, at a, in Brussels last week um, at the Realty event, and there the difference between German investors and UK investors was quite interesting because the UK investors were talking about um, the danger of terrorism and um, terrorist attacks in Brussels and the impact on that, whereas the German concerns were much more about Belgium's inability to form a government um, in the last year. That was the main concern and not the terrorist ones at all. So very interesting, the different kind of perspectives on, on risk. Um, one quick thing I wanted to touch on. Uh, did you want to come in? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one thing on this, uh, um, uh, when you look at the, uh, at the private equity scene, 
Um, and you look at the Brexit, the fear of the, of the investors. I mean, Johannes Hood in, in Bloomberg, the, the head of uh, KKR for, for Europe, he clearly said everything is now on hold until they have a, a, a much more clear view what's, what's going to happen in uh, investments in the UK. So uh, smart investors have a look at this. Um, uh, political impact, but I, I fully agree. I mean, it's 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 a matter of perception. It's uh, depending on your um, investor's point of view. Um, and coming back to your point about the terrorism in the 70s and 80s on the continent, much more people died out of local terrorism in Northern Ireland, in Germany, in France, in in Spain. So, um, and these days, um, the events I think are more um, present in the press. And uh, this is, um, again, a perception matter, yeah? Um, facts don't matter, perception matters. And this is uh, what I learned years ago when I was in the bank. Yeah? It was uh, much more driven by, by expectations, by, 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 uh, but, but, but rather less than, f uh, than on facts. And this is uh, what currently the mainstream is, or became over the, over the years after, after 2008. That's, that's, that's clearly driving investors' uh, decisions. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I've, I've got some, some time for questions, so if anybody's got any questions, any thoughts, um, please do raise your hands. Um, has anybody got any questions at this stage? Oh, we're obviously answering all of your questions. That's very good. Anyway, you've, you've got another five minutes to think about them, and then I'll come back to you. Um, what, um, what, I, what I wanted to pick up was, um, in terms of in terms of international investors looking at the market, and maybe to you, um, Eva, in, in terms of asset management, um, how important is that, um, given that you've got different countries, different regions, at different, different growth phases and paces, how important is that when you're looking at the market? I think that the local asset management is extremely important because, first of all, the people who are local, they know the uh, local culture, then they know a language, and they know they have the connections, they know a lot of people. So I believe that the, if somebody wants to be the good asset manager and if somebody ha would like to have the good return on the investment capital, they need to have the local offices. And uh, clearly the people who are there, they, think they, they, they can take care of the assets and they they can uh, react immediately whenever something happens and internally they build a re relation with the for example, uh, all the tenants whenever because in our portfolio we have a diversity uh, of the of the assets as well we have logistics we have uh, office we have retail so i can I can see clearly that if somebody is on the daily basis involved from the asset management perspective uh, it, it, it has the positive impact and it has the positive results. So I believe, plus I would say that uh, compared to what was 20 years ago, of course there were not so many people who were experienced, who had enough knowledge and who understood also the real estate market right now is a completely different situation. And so I, I would even say that uh, those people who started 20 years ago, the adventure or the professional life with the real estate, they learned from the scratch everything. So they learned in line with the, uh, with the market which was evolving and they, they managed to survive the crisis, they managed to face uh, with the very huge difficulties and how to, let's say, make the, the business still ongoing. So they had a huge experience and they are, um, they are very active locally and they have also the ambitions and they are very, um, they are very skillful and experienced. Yeah, this is, this is what we see when we go into um, fundraising that investors um, um, Required to have your, the, the asset management in-house, because the time of this kind of joystick management, asset management, is over, uh, and that's the lesson um, what everybody learned um, after or during the crisis in 2008, and 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 afterwards that you have to manage your asset and not somebody in the country who is um, more or less experienced um, or belonging to a wider group of um, other services um, where they're going to make, make use of this yeah, mm, yeah, com competitive advantage, put it that way, in order to um, do the asset management and sell other services and out of a sudden your office building is empty because next door is once, once built and all the tenants moved uh, across the street. And that's what we see, what, we, what, we, what I experienced during my banking times that we completely shifted our, our view as well. So the, 
the lenders these days, they um, keep an eye on this as well. So I'm currently advising um, a client for, for a large transaction in Germany, and I had, I had a chat with one, one of Walter's colleagues, and he said, what's the experience of, these, of those guys? They're doing a pretty much great business, but tell me. Yeah, give, uh, give me an idea. So this is uh, where you see whether it's investors, uh, whether these are lenders, um, all, all across the board, everybody wants to see asset management being driven in-house. Okay, good. Uh, we'll um, <clears throat> I fully agree. I mean, asset management is one of the most important questions in every credit committee that I sit in. Um, and, and, and that's clearly also experience uh, and you know if, if there's one or two things that you take from the last crisis asset management I think is very much on top of the list um, and, and, and maybe just also to sort of um, create a bridge here between asset management and political risks the two topics we just discussed um, one shouldn't forget that the, 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 the political risk um, is not the risk that you will be expropriated, you will lose, uh, lose your buildings, um, you know, um, uh, every, everything will go belly up. I think the real political risk is illiquidity. So what happens in the next crisis? In which markets will deals continue to be made? And in which markets uh, will it stop for a while? And, and we, you know, Hungary is a good example. Hungary was virtually the standstill for the last four or five years. If you did not have good asset management during that time, that would have been a problem. So I think part of the asset management story is also the medium-term perspective. Can you, manage, can you actually manage a building through a phase of illiquidity? Okay, good. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on, on development, um, Shamslav, particularly, um, you recently made a, a an investment into ECHO. So does that mean that you're seeing opportunities across the region in development, redevelopment, um, obviously development more difficult in a way in, in Western Europe, but maybe in Central and Eastern Europe? Is that where you see a big opportunity? Well, ECHO investment was, investment into ECHO was not, uh, in terms of our underwriting, was not only about buying into development platform, it was buying into a company which was on one side, you know, accumulator of assets, on the other side, a development business. So, we, our sum of part analysis, analysis proved that, you know, it was worth more than, you know, the market cap at the time. And uh, the deal we redefined proves that point. So, uh, so we remain with, uh, with Echo Investments, which is today the largest uh, commercial developer in Poland. And we would like to focus on Poland. We are not planning on venturing outside of Poland. Uh, to the opposite, we have one project within Echo in, in, in Budapest, which we are selling off. We're not going to be doing anything outside of Poland for the foreseeable future. And it's mostly because we are so busy here. We see so many things here that we don't need to, you know, go outside and we don't need to look for opportunities outside of Poland. Uh, in, uh, you know, in office space, it's clearly uh, driven by regional cities and uh, the BPO uh, uh, trends. Uh, in retail, it's everything. Because retail still, you know, in certain areas, it's uh, still underserved or, or uh, underinvested. So we see our role there. Uh, Echo will be is building uh, is doing extension of Galaxy in uh, in Szczecin. We'll be building soon. We we'll start soon in Katowice, a new shopping center. So very busy, and focus will be uh, literally on Poland. Echo is also fourth largest uh, uh, Resi developer in Poland, and we're going to grow that platform both uh, organically and through acquisitions. Okay, good. Um, does anyone have any 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 questions? Any final thoughts? Um, I've got one last question, um, which is slightly self-serving, um, which is that Property EU, as you can see, is 10 years old, um, and we'll be doing um, later on in later on in the year in Amsterdam a deal of the decade um, to celebrate that because we thought that might be quite fun. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you, and I'm going to start with you, Walter, because you look as though you weren't ready for that. Um, I'm going to ask you what you think the most interesting deal is. Could be the best deal, could be the worst deal, um, could just be the most innovative deal. But over the last 10 years, what do you think has been the most interesting deal that you've seen and will stick to this region? There's more than one I can think of, um, but the, the theme is the same, which is enter a market at the right point in time early in the cycle when the fundamentals are right, but not everybody else is there. Um, 
a good example, um, because we all talked about Hungary over the last couple of uh, uh, hours and uh, yesterday as well, uh, would be uh, Morgan Stanley's acquisition of a portfolio of office buildings in Budapest last year, where they basically bought at a cap rate, which would be 150 basis points higher than it is today. Um, and that's only 18 months. Um, we've had similar, uh, similar transactions uh, in the Czech Republic maybe three or four years ago. Uh, where yields were still attractive, so I think I, for me, for me, a good deal is, is 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 when somebody manages to sort of be ahead of the crowd, um, invest in in good property, in 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 markets that are early in the cycle. Okay, good. Shemislav, your your deal of the decade and why? Well, I'm a wrong person to ask, and I'm going to be objective. We completed yesterday the largest ever deal being done in Central and Eastern Europe and the largest deal in Europe this year, so uh, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Good, Eva. So for me, uh, of course, we can talk about the Griffins investment or Union investment, but for me, um, I would like to uh, look ahead, in fact, and to, um, to wait until Warsaw Spire is uh, finalized, because in my opinion, it will be the new opening and the new chapter of the uh, of the investment market, especially office in Warsaw. Okay, so I'll revisit this in 10 years' time and see if that was the deal of the decade. <laughs> Marcus. There are a lot, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to say the deal of a decade. Um, I mean, we have seen a, um, a lot of very good deals. I mean, yeah, the Echo deal very recently. But looking really back in, in history, I think the uh, Metro sale and lease back um, um, with Apollo Reader, this was a benchmark deal at that time, um, and um, anything else. Um, I think Hungary, um, it was, in my opinion, the, um, the new um, TV station headquarter building, uh, which, was a, which was a benchmark as well. Uh, they ran into difficulties then with the, with the government. So, um, um, but all in all, um, I think this was a very, a, a very good one as well. And the third one is, um, I think the, the success story in Romania of um, local shopping centers um, run by um, Duskalu, the Julius Malls, uh, very, very professionally being done, um, uh, went into a crisis during the crisis, survived the crisis, and uh, been back on, on the road again. Great. Doris. Well, similar to my fellow panelists, I struggled a bit to pin down the one deal. Um, so I would rather like to relate it to buildings than necessarily deals. Um, I guess the one element that I find impressive is given that um, particularly Warsaw has gone through a number of cycles. And when you look at buildings which were built 10, 15 years ago, some of them have become obsolete over the time. So they should be rather looking at those who really maintained their value, who have proven to be the sustainable ones. And to start with, I think that's a perfect example of Warsaw Financial Center. It may not be the best building in the market, obviously, now, but when you look at when this was built, I mean, they have invested in quality at the time, so that was certainly with foresight. Now, I guess, Metropolitan Rondo, they are in that category. And we'll see in about 10 years' time, as you said, whether Spire is going to be in the same category. 